So we're choosing an arbitrary five years as kind of our way to gauge how much is this going to end up being. So if I have $100 at the start, after one year, I'm going to have 20 more than that. So I have to add 20 to it. After the second year, I would add 20 to that. And basically, I just keep adding 20 until I get up to having done five. And so we end up doing 100 plus five 20s, which gives us a total of 200. Because, of course, 20 plus itself five times, or in other words, five times 20, gives us 100. And 100 plus 100 is 200. So in this case, we would have $200 at the end of the fifth year. Okay? Hopefully straightforward. So then the question is, how do we do it for the 20%? So, let's again take it year by year, because there's not just one way that we can just write it out and have it look really quick and easy at the moment, so we're going to break it down year by year. This is where your paper is going to be needed, and a calculator is going to be needed as well. So the first thing I want to do is I want to figure out how much will we have at the end of the first year. I want to figure out if I go up by 20%, how much will I have then? Well, I start with my 100 again. I want to figure out what 20% of that is. So what do I do with the 100? What do I do to the 100 in order to figure out 20% of it? Exactly, yes. We multiply it by 0.2. Because we're taking our percent and we're writing it first as a decimal. So. 20%, we divide it by 100 or move the decimal over two places, you end up getting 0.2. So I do 100 times 0.2. And then I, that tells me what the 20% is, so I add it to the original amount. So at the end of the first year, I have $120. Same thing, right? At the end of the next year, am I going to have $140? No, because it's a No. Yep. Because it's going up by 20% a year. On the first year, it went up 20% of 100. But for the second year, it is going to go up by 20% of 120. What is 20% of 120 now? So we take our 120 and we again multiply it by 0.2. And when you do that, we get 24. So notice, the first year, the amount of money that we had grew by $20. But the second year, the amount of money that we have, it grows by $24. And so instead of having just $140, we now have $144. Okay? The next year, is it going to go up by $24? No. It goes up by even more than that, right? We can keep going through and doing the same calculation every single year. So the third year, I figure out what 20% of 144 is. That's 28.8, or in other words, $28.80. And if I add that to the 144 that I started that year with, I end up finding out that at the end of the fourth year, I have $172.80. But we're going to figure out what it is at the end of the fifth year, so we got to go one more, or actually two more, this was third. So here's our fourth year. And then notice, by the way, at the end of the fourth year, we have $207.36. That's already more than we got from having five years at $20 a year. But if we go ahead and take this out to the fifth year, this is what we end up looking at. Now this is very tedious to do five times, of course, and so I don't want to have to do it five times every time. Um, and a reminder here, yes, it's going up by an even bigger amount each year. I want to talk about vocabulary a little bit. When you hear people talk about compounding interest, this is what we're talking about. It's called compounding interest because you are earning interest on your interest. That's what it means to compound. And so you earn more, and then you earn more than that, and then you earn more than that. And that's why compounding interest ends up being such a big deal to a lot of people when we start talking finances. All right, so I do want to continue practicing this, 
but it's a bit of a pain doing this out even five times. So we're going to look at examples today, but we're going to focus on a lot of examples where I'm going to have us just go two years. So we aren't going to have to do it all that many times. So here we have a situation where we have $500 earmarked to buy a car. So you got paid, you put aside $500, you're ready to go buy a car with it, but of course you can't buy a car that you want for $500 yet. So you figure it's going to take you another two years to get the rest of the money. We're going to look at lots of different angles for answering this same question today because we want to figure out where should we keep the $500. Well, most of you have at least like a checking and savings account, right? So you could just put it into your checking account or put it into your savings account. We'll also be talking as we go through this today, not only just about the math, but actually some of the meanings behind these things and some useful information about these things. So uh, when we talk checking and savings accounts, checking accounts, basically it's a way to have your money be really easily accessible. That's the point of a checking account is you want to be able to get access to it quickly and easily. Uh, usually a checking account earns no interest. If you find one that does pay you interest, be happy about that. Take whatever they give you but don't expect to be making any money off of that checking account. Savings account. Uh, usually you can't write checks directly from a savings account. Now there's again a few exceptions, but in general, in order to take money out of your savings, you would have to transfer it into your checking account, and then you could write a check out of that. And a savings account will earn you some interest, because by leaving it there a little bit more, they can go and invest it a little bit so they can make a little bit of money out of it so they pay you a little bit of money for putting in the savings. So you earn a little bit of interest. So your money can grow over time if you put it in a savings account. There's an advantage there. Now, looking at these options, which one would you think would make the most sense for putting our $500 in savings. if we're trying to, you know, get a car in two years? Well... There's pros and cons to each. Um, let's start with how much would we have in the account in two years if we put it in checking? Yeah, it, it would be $500 plus any interest that they give us or anything that we add. Uh, but basically, just based on that information alone, they're not paying us interest in a checking account, so it's just going to be $500. So it doesn't give you a whole lot of improvement there, but it is a place to keep it. It's a lot better than having $500 bills sitting under your mattress where your brother or sister might sneak in and find it and all of a sudden you don't have $500 anymore. <laughs> uh, it's at least a more secure place to keep it. But, of course, one downside of a checking account is it is easily accessible, right? If you see $500 sitting in your checking account, are you going to just leave it there? Yeah, most of us are going to be like, well, I know I was saving it for a car, but this new phone came out, and my phone's almost dead, so I'm going to go ahead and spend it on that instead. And then your car is now another year out or whatever it is. So checking accounts, yeah, it's accessible, but sometimes that's a bad thing. If you're trying to save up towards something, you don't necessarily want access to it quickly and easily. And so that's where we get into the savings account. And so if we put the money into the savings account, how much would it be worth in two years? Yeah, we need a little bit more information, right? We need to know what they're going to pay us for putting this money in savings. So let's say we're going to put $500 in and just leave the $500 sitting there. Now, these are current rates for a standard savings account. I looked these up yesterday and put them in there, so this is kind of real stuff that you can expect. So Bank of America will pay you a whopping 0.03% of your money every year. BECU is better than that. They'll pay you 0.1%, but Chase, uh, well, they're behind both of those even. That's 0.01%. These really are not high percentages, right? Let's take a moment. I'd like you to choose one of these and calculate what that value would give us. Now, which one should you pick? Well, if you're already banking with one of these, choose the one you bank with. You can see kind of what that's really doing. If you don't, well, then choose one that maybe your parents work with or one that you might choose to go to 
or just pick one at random. But go ahead and choose one. Calculate what you would have after two years, please. Just two years. We don't need to go through the whole thing up to five years or something. So I'm going to go ahead and do the calculation here for BECU. I'm going to use that 0.1%. So we would do 500 times that 0.1% though. I'm not going to do 0.1%. Remember, I have to turn the percent into a decimal. What is 0.1% as a decimal? So we actually have to do 500 times 0 0.001. If you're doing the Bank of America, that's going to be 0 0.0003. If you're doing Chase, that's 0 0.0001. 15 cents. So... If you are in Bank of America, after the first year, you have earned 15 cents of interest. And then you do the 500.15 times the 0 .0003, add that to the original, and you end up with 500.3, or in other words, $500.30 for Bank of America. And so this is the work for this. Now, in this case, I earned 15 cents the first year, and then I earned 15 cents the second year. Why didn't we get more the second year? Well, we did. It's just that when I did that calculation out here, it gave me 0.15 and then some decimals. But when I rounded it, it still rounded to 0.15. Over the two years, with such a small percentage, we aren't really able to take much advantage of the compounding interest. It's happening but it's so small that it's hardly noticeable yet. All right, now, that set of numbers that we were just looking at was for a standard savings account. If you're actually putting money in and you're using it to actually save and you'd like it to go up a little bit more over time, one of the great tools to use is what's called a money market savings account. Uh, this is another type of savings account but usually it pays a higher interest rate, but it comes with more restrictions, like you can only make one or two withdrawals a month. Uh, there's some little things like that, but if you're truly using it as a savings account, saving up towards like one big purchase in the future, you don't care if you can only make one withdrawal a month, because you don't want to be taking money out of that all the time. That's the point of a savings account. You do the rest in a checking account. Now, money market savings accounts, again, we can look at what current rates are, and so these are a few current rates. Now, I only got a few of them in here because of a couple different things. One, many banks didn't have information available online on the current money market rates. Or the other thing with money market accounts is sometimes there's a minimum balance required in order to have one. And here we're looking at $500 that we're savings in it. And for some of them, their minimum was higher than that. Usually, the more you are willing to put in and leave in an account at a bank, the higher interest rate they'll pay you but again, it's something to look for. Now, you'll notice here, the money market rates are higher than the standard rates, but they still aren't great. But if you know you're gonna be leaving the money there for a while, it's better than nothing. At least they're giving you a little bit of something. Even if it's just an extra dollar a year or something, it's something, we'll take it. But be very cautious when you do look at opening these kinds of accounts. For instance, when I went and was looking up this information, I looked at the U.S. Bank money market account, and the, their money market account, they give you an extra interest rate. They pay you a whole 0.04 interest per year, which, as we saw, doesn't get you a whole lot. After our two years, that would be about 40 cents. But for the joy of using this particular account, which is paying you a little bit more each month, they're going to charge you $10 a month. All of a sudden, our $500 that was growing by 40 cents becomes more like a few hundred dollars. Our money is shrinking in this account because of the fees. So when you go to look to open an account, always ask about what fees there are associated with it and how to avoid fees because the fees will kill you. Now, so far we've looked at checking and savings. These options aren't great. Uh, we're getting cents for hundreds of dollars. So what other options might we have if we want to know that we are going to leave this money alone for two years 
What else can we do that maybe would be better? Now, as we go through these options, there's a lot of trade-offs. So pay attention to the various trade-offs along the way. So, one more option. Online savings accounts have become a bigger and bigger thing. Where you give your money through electronic transfers to a bank that only takes place online, and then we can actually get maybe more of a rate there. Uh, we can get certificates of deposits, or what we just call CDs. We can get bonds, we can get stocks. So let's take a look at each of those. In an online savings account, if you choose to go that route, the key phrase that you're looking for is FDIC insured. Whenever you see that phrase on a bank account, what it means is that if the bank fails, so like the bank all of a sudden says, we're no longer in business, if that happens, if they're not FDI insured, they take your money with you. If it is FDI insured, the federal government is insuring that money and they will give you your money back. So you need to make sure that any place you put your money, that it is FDIC insured. Okay, a couple of little details about the online savings account. Uh, your money is less accessible in an online savings account because you're dealing with a place that has no brick and mortar locations. In other words, you can't go into your local branch. So how do you get cash out? They aren't going to mail it in an envelope to you, right? And so it's a lot trickier to get your money out when you need it. There's a lot of electronic transfers and things like that involved. But you do get higher rates. Remember what our regular savings accounts were paying us? It was like 0.1%. Notice the online savings accounts... Right now, an average one is paying about two and a quarter percent. That's a lot more. But of course, you're paying for it with some inconvenience. Certificates of deposit. Um, basically, what this is, is you are saying, I'm going to leave the money alone for this amount of time, and I am not going to touch it, period. I am guaranteeing that I will not touch it for two years, say. Again, make sure it's FDI insured. But again, by doing that, you get a much higher rate. Now, the certificate of deposit, this is actually a product you can buy through your local bank. So like, if you already have a checking account, you can say, I'd like to buy a $500 certificate of deposit, and they'll be able to hook you up with that, and at the end of the two years, they'll be able to give you the money for it. So that can all happen locally. You don't have to deal with the online inconvenience in that case. And I'm skipping the calculations here at the end about figuring out how much our $500 would be worth in these cases, just because we're kind of limited on time. Our next product is bonds. So you've probably seen that word come up before, like what's a bond, but you probably haven't known. Here's your chance to find out. A bond is basically a business or even a government, like Bothell sells bonds. The US government sells bonds. Basically, they're saying, we need to borrow some money, but we are big, so we're going to borrow it from lots of little people. In other words, we're going to borrow our corporate money from you. And we will pay you a certain interest rate for that loan. And just like a loan that you would take out, it has a certain term on it. This loan has a term on it as well. So you can buy a two-year bond, for instance, although they typically are longer than that. But there are ones that are two years. They're, ge they're generally low risk as long as it's for somebody who's financially solid. You know, like if Microsoft issued a bond, you could feel pretty good about it because Microsoft isn't going to go out of business in the next two years. But, and, and yeah, that's why U.S. Treasury bonds are very secure as well. But if it's a company that's like having a lot of financial trouble, it's a higher risk then. So, I mean, be careful about who you're loaning your money to because if they go out of business, they're not paying you back. The last option that we mentioned up there earlier is stocks. Now, stocks are usually done for longer terms, but it technically is an option for even a two-year term. What happens if you buy stocks is you're technically purchasing a piece of the company, or in other words, a share of the company, hence why they talk about shares of stock. They are considered high risk compared to all of these other things. Because, for instance, the typical market rate like if you look at the whole stock market over the last like 30 years, it's gone up by like 10% per year. But when I say typical market rate, 
it's not like a guaranteed 10%. All these other ones, you're guaranteed to go up by that amount each year. With a stock, it depends on the market. So it might go up 10%, it might go up 20%, or it can even lose money, depending on how that business is doing. So when you're looking at investing in stocks, you have to be aware that your money can go up or down. So that's why I would not put your money in a stock for just two years. If it happens to be a bad year, your money went away. And it went way down. So like when you started with 500, you might end up with 300. 